Thank you so much, Malin, and thank you for giving me a chance to present my research here. Since uh, our team started with a personal remark, allow me to also uh, continue with a personal remark. In this very room here, the Vorsar conference room of our institute, um, it is 15 years ago, we had a seminar on conflict resolution that was organized for the Crown Princess of Sweden, Victoria, and there was a select group of honor students, eight honor students, whom I selected, and Artemi was one of them. So we were sitting here for half a day and discussing with the Crown Princess uh, issues of conflict resolution all over the world. So this is one of the great memories, actually, um, because how often do you really meet um, a Crown Princess? <laughs> Again, my first one. <laughs> well, I know, I know. Same for me. Same for me. Uh, the second thing that uh, I want to say is that also in this room, uh, three years ago we had um, a guest from Uzbekistan, um, uh, Shukrat Abbasov, uh, who was uh, going back to one of the presentations today, a Chilavik Rashidova, right? So, so they called him, uh, you know, that after uh, 1983 and uh, before he was really one of the privileged members of the uh, Soviet Uzbek uh, 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 upper caste, and then he became one of the outcasts. And uh, then again, he was rehabilitated. And now we come actually to the topic uh, that without having planned this, uh, we did not communicate about our papers before, there is some real interesting synergy about uh, that. Um, we, we talked about some uh, uh, kind of personal experiences during the late Soviet period, uh, and, uh, and so one of the questions that was raised was how did you actually combine a, uh, a certain obedience to Islamic uh, values and, and laws, and at the same time membership in the Communist Party obedience to atheism, uh, you know, uh, eating pork, and so on and so on. And um, so, and Abbasov said to this, I said, we all lived like that, right? And I think this schizoid uh, type of experience, of social experience uh, in regards to religious values is really worth looking at, and uh, uh, looking at in the sense of also elite continuity, right? So the question was about elites. Um, <laughs> Uh, how come that, especially in Central Asia, uh, Central Asian republics, we have this this uh, peculiar elite continuity where uh, it seems first as all of them are turncoats and simply opportunists, but actually it wasn't all that uh, unusual and uncommon for them to uh, practice a certain uh, kind of schizoid type of value uh, uh, consciousness and and be at the same time loyal to certain value traditions, including some uh, Islamic traditions, and also values of the Communist Party. That's why I think this elite uh, transition from Soviet to post-Soviet was a rather uh, smooth one. And so that's really what I want to talk about. Uh, I picked one film here, uh, Hotel Megin, Paris is the title, I apologize for my uh, pronunciation here, um, but it's uh, Atone for Your Guild or Assuage Your Guild. Um, and it's the title of a film that was made in 1983. And the author of the screenplay um, uh, was actually a member of the Communist Party, as was the author of the underlying story. Um, and uh, still in their title you have a religious notion, which is a rich notion, and of course you can uh, kind of de- um, uh, 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 Islamifies that if you wish, but actually in the title it has a very prominent position. And so I wanted to look a little uh, more closely at uh, religious aspects of cinema in Kazakhstan, a subject that I've studied and I've been studying for the last uh, six years here in this institute, and I was lucky to have my colleagues uh, in the Central Asian um, field to actually you know, uh, surround me and, and, and stimulate my thinking in this. So let me first say, religion as part of everyday life in Soviet Kazakhstan was a sensitive topic for national cinema. In the silent period, there were these uh, agitkas, uh, so uh, very simplistic um, uh, short films with a strong didactic agenda, and they were part of aggressive anti-religious campaigns. Such movies were used as a means of atheist education, often associated with the issue of women's liberation. A problem during that early period was that cinema itself in Central Asia was considered a dubious and even dangerous medium. In many places, men didn't allow their wives to attend film screening, uh, the more so if the topic was political or anti-religious. Uh, often, screenings of anti-religious propaganda movies had to be organized during the day, and there were special screening, screenings exclu exclusively for women and not mixed audiences. Mm -hmm. A problem for anti-religious film propaganda was also language. 
uh, in the Kazakh mainland, few people understood Russian, and the projectionist who came with these films and you know, traveled to Steppe uh, had to summarize the content of a film prior to the screening or simultaneously translate the Russian intertitles into Kazakh. Since Kazakhstan had no studio of its own, politically important films were sent from the Russian Federation, where sometimes Kazakh <coughs> intertitles uh, were added. Such was the case with The Muslim Woman, that was one such propaganda film, or Under the Power of the Adab, all in the late 1920s, which negatively depict the life of women under the Tsarist regime and which were considered valuable for anti-religious propaganda. When feature film production in Central Asia began in earnest in the late 1930s, the topic of religion in Kazakhstan was largely avoided. For example, the first films with Kazakh subject matter, Aman Gildi and Raikhan, one 1938, the other 1940, both produced in Leningrad with Kazakh uh, talent, uh, well, heavily pro-Soviet, but they do not contain any references to organized religion at all. The same is true for the first Kazakhstani films proper that were made in the mid-1950s in Almaty. For example, in the emancipation drama Daughter of the Steps, 1954, which visualizes a number of factors hindering the title heroine's self-realization, Islam is not one of them. In the virgin soil drama We Live Here, 1956, also produced in Kazakhstan, an elderly mother opposes her daughter's marriage to a Russian, we did not plan that, <laughs> stating, he is not of our faith. But this is a standalone uh, statement, and it's not elaborated on in the film. And furthermore, this character, this, this mother, is depicted as traditionalist, but not necessarily negative. So, as a matter of fact, she later acquiesces to the inter-ethnic uh, marriage. If mentioned at all, religion in Kazakh films was handled with tact, or left out completely. The same is true for the early 1960s, during the brutal atheist campaigns unleashed by Nikita Khrushchev. In Kazakhstani cinema, nobody picked up on that topic, unlike Russian cinema, where there were a number of anti-religious feature films and documentaries. In Shakin Aymanov's 1960 debate drama in one district, largely forgotten but still interesting from an ideological point of view, a young party secretary proposes to start the production of pork in their district because it is profitable. But an older communist, Kazakh, replies, you don't know our people. <laughs> Otherwise, the film does not contain any allusions to Islam or religious rules. Uh, Aymanov's best picture, by the way, Land of the Fathers, made in 1960s, or released in 1966, was produced uh, shortly after Khrushchev's ouster, when the religious policies of the communist establishment became more relaxed. The film's main character, an old man who travels to Leningrad in the summer of 1945 to find the remains of his son, and bury them in native soil, observes religious rules, although the topic is never verbalized. This avoidance strategy in Kazakhstani cinema changed in the 1980s. It's important to emphasize that um, if the notion of so uh, late Soviet culture, which was discussed uh, in the first panel, is defined as the 1970s and 1980s, and there's a lot that speaks for that, uh, Kazakhstani cinema was a clear beneficiary of that period. Some of its greatest hits and highest artistic achievements for example, uh, Hojikov's Kuzhribek, every Kazakh knows that film, or uh, the, Grace, fe the Grey Fierce One from an Aoizov story about a wolf cup, were produced during those years. This period of late Soviet culture also marks an aggressive stance vis-a-vis -vis violations of the official ideological status quo that resulted in the shelving of a number of films, for example, uh, Mansurov's The Funeral Feast, uh, Pusurmanov's The White Ariana, Neither of them contained explicit references to religion, but there were other reasons why they were prohibitive. And that's the interesting part that one can also observe the emergence of a category of films that successfully went under the radar of sensor sensorial watchfulness. I call them small, low-budget pictures, in which a non-Soviet approach toward religion emerges with surprising consistency. One of these critically underrated films of the 1980s that deserves a closer look is Atoned for Your Guild. The Russian title was Iskupi Vinu, made in 1983. Um, it features an intriguing, very simple plot. Uh, there is a young man by the name of Sultan. Um, he drives in his car and he suddenly gets in an accident and he dies in that accident. And, and that's the first uh, episode that we see without any words spoken. Uh, very light modern music uh, accompanies that. And then there is a very sharp contrast to the very traditional uh, burial uh, and, and all the funeral rituals that accompany that um, afterwards. And uh, uh, at the funeral, many good words are said about the deceased, but then the imam asks, does the deceased owe a debt to anyone? 
While this question is rhetorical and part of the ritual, the essential truth to which it points is the subject of the movie, which then only unfolds. So the old father rides his horse on the river, he remembers his son, and there is this melancholic Dambra music, which is stands in sharp contrast to the modern music before. And then a, a driver uh, comes from Almaty, and he says, uh, he starts talking to this, this father, who is, of course, still grieving, and says, do you know that your son may have had a child in the city? And, uh, and of course, Kurabek knows nothing about that, and he's shocked, and he wants to know more, and maybe it's just a rumor, but then that would be a debt that his son, Sultan, has left behind, and a very substantial one. So he eventually makes the decision to travel to the city and, um, and look for that uh, grandson of his. Uh, he stays with a friend of uh, Sultan's, uh, a young man named Nurlan, who lives with his girlfriend. So this is already a transition from rural traditionalist Khalistan to modern urban Khalistan, and it's emphasized in everything, in the um, uh, interior, in the decorations, in the music, uh, in how people behave. They're still traditionalist enough to know that they have to host an old man from their Aul, but the same time they secretly quarrel. Oh, we wanted to go to the theater, and now this guy is here. You know, can't, you know. So, so there's a, kind of a, a friction between old and new values. And then it turns out that Sultan had one girlfriend whom he left, uh, who denies having any child. Has another girlfriend who has a child, uh, and and uh, he didn't know that she was pregnant. Uh, she hid it from him, and. Um, her, that girl's uh, mother, uh, so the child's grandmother, is really angry at Sultan and, and, and shows Kozabek this anger that here's your son, look what he has done. And, but the girl is rather happy. Then there's a third woman uh, who uh, Sultan was also in love with and whom he maybe wanted to marry. So uh, Kozabek begins to learn that the private life of his son was so different from anything he could have ever imagined that he leaves the city in deep uh, mourning, and not just about having lost his son, but also about the fact that he didn't know anything about these cultural changes um, and, and this, this incredible cultural contrast between a traditionalist rural uh, place and, and urban place. So, so this film, Atonement for Your Guild, is, and, and by the way, I want to mention that, that there is nothing Soviet in this film. There is no uh, slogans, there is no pictures of the leaders, there is no reference to the Communist Party, nothing. It could have been made. Uh, after 1991 uh, and, and so on, and they said there is no reference to um, Sovietness whatsoever. So first of all, it's remarkable for its expli explicit religious framing of the narrative, uh, to which the title itself alludes. So the film features a prayer in one of the opening episodes, and also a prayer at the conclusion. For a Soviet picture made in the early 1980s, this is very unusual. It's also a very moralistic film, and one can say that um, there is a profound unease about social trends in modern day, and at that point still solidly Soviet, Kazakhstan. The more the father learns about his son, the more he realizes how little he knew him. He is guided by rural tradition, was completely unaware of these profound um, changes, so um, now he has to kind of bring these two uh, different spheres uh, and these these moral um, uh, contrasts uh, and and uh, and disagreements together. By the way, that's what I meant in this axiological word in the title. So it's really about uh, value-based uh, problems that the film uh, raises. Um, so the film's position vis-à-vis -vis these issues can be defined as moderately traditionalist, mostly implicitly so, pointing to the existential contradictions within modern urban trends. So while the traditional rural uh, value system is not questioned, the, mar the modern uh, urban one is questioned. And uh, one thing is, for example, that uh, uh, Nurlan's girlfriend, while she insists on making her own decisions and being an emancipated woman, she also is eager to finally get a, propose a proposition from, from, from her uh, fiance, she, she finally wants to be married. And, and so, in a way, there is this, this constant um, friction between traditional expectations and uh, more modern, um, anti traditional um, uh, ways of uh, behavior. Um, reviewing his. Oh, Nurlan, actually. This is the interesting. Uh, so, so, the film is actually, as I said, implicitly uh, <coughs> traditionalist, but there's one didactic element, and that is that Nurlan, this friend of Sultan's, who lives with his girlfriend in this modern apartment, um, when he begins to realize what Sultan's life has actually been like, uh, he decides to finally 
uh, propose to his to his girlfriend and and uh, create some sort of uh, stability in personal um, relationships. And um, we, you know, this is a kind of a constructive message. It's uh, a little bit uh, also simplistic, but um, it is uh, the opposite of what really regular films from Soviet modernity would have expected because basically in the 1920s uh, all of these uh, old values including marriage stability and so on, all of that were uh, put in doubt and were um, uh, 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 subverted and so here Atone for Your Guild really in a way you could say opposes implicitly the entire 50-60 years of uh, Soviet uh, values uh, in regards to private relationships um, before. The film never preaches these traditionalist values. It allows the viewer to draw their own conclusions, but it displays a quite tragic tonality. And uh, um, while we do not have a fully formulated alternative moral concept, uh, the film explores the legacy of this short life of Sultan and arrives at a largely negative conclusion. He does have a debt. He was never able to atone for this debt, and now it is the father's debt that he's um, taking over. Um, so, in my view, atone for your guilt proves that the quest for stable traditional values and a tr traditional value system had remained intact even in a late Soviet urban environment. Uh, this seemingly private story, um, of which the dubbed version premiered in Moscow in 1984, preempts the turn of late Soviet society toward traditional values and religious values, uh, including religious values, that became prominent in the perestroika. Uh, so I just want to want to remind people of this because you know not everybody has lived through this perestroika period that it started with the rehabilitation of spiritual slash religious values such as milosirdi, right? So there was this big campaign that we need to learn or relearn milosirdi, mercy and forgiveness toward um, other people. Uh, the most famous film of that period, the Georgian film uh, uh, Abuladze's Repentance, of course, also has in the title a religious uh, term and, and was basically a programmatic film uh, that, that really uh, was embraced by the communist leadership uh, under Gorbachev uh, during those years. It was released in 1986. And finally, I just want to say this as a little footnote here, the author of the story uh, that uh, uh, was the base for this film, Atone for Your Guild, uh, Tolian Abdikov, born 1942. At the time when this film was made, he was the head of the Department of Literature of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Kazakhstan. Right? So not only was he a party member, he was a, a member of the nomenclatura. Right? In 1994, he became a personal assistant to the president of Kazakhstan. Right? So, so I said, th this, this is the, I think when we, when we evaluate um, uh, moral values, the, the, uh, the stance of moral values, the, the situation of religion um, in Central Asia, but not only uh, in, this, in the late Soviet uh, period, we have to um, include our knowledge of this strange coexistence of values and of value systems um, that uh, made it possible for members of the higher ranks of the Communist Party uh, to both follow and observe certain Islamic rules and at the same time um, uh, also uh, profess uh, uh, atheism and atheist um, education and so on and so on. And just going back to what we said today about Rashidov, uh, I was just recently in, uh, in Almaty <coughs> in the uh, House Museum of Din Muhammad Kunaev, the then leader until 1985 of the Communist Party of Kazakhstan, and uh, we, you, you can actually buy a personal tour there. And, uh, and so they will tell you all kinds of things about his background, professional and personal, his genealogy, and so on, so on. And then at the very end of the tour, which was really, really fascinating, because to see this, this 300 uh, square meter apartment with all these books and so on, so on um, it's just fascinating for the, for the mentality of this, of this elite. But then uh, the tour guide said he also was a Muslim. And so, and, and I looked a little bit in disbelief, and, and so then she also looked at me, and she said, "Well, not in every respect." But uh, then she began to list what things he did and what things he did not do, and that began that really intrigued me. So I talked to one of the film directors I interviewed, uh, who met uh, Kunaev after his ouster, and he said, "For him, this is hard to believe." So where where he met Kunaev in his private uh, rooms at a spa there was nothing that indicated any sort of religious uh, uh, you know, connections or religious uh, interest even. 
Uh, so th that to me is really one of the, the big enigmas, really. And to what degree were these people completely atheist, or did they have somewhere a certain tolerance or, or respect for religious values, at least of their parents, maybe of their wives? Uh, how far did that go? Uh, but what I can say uh, with certainty is that uh, in, in the film production of Kazakhstan, uh, this type of um, not only respect, but actually embracing these traditional values did take place, and uh, films such as Atone for Your Guild is uh, uh, definitely a proof of that. So, thank you very much.